Hi, I'm Lisa Kamen, and I'll be moderating our session today as we discuss the concern over a growing movement across the U.S. by legislators and others to lower the professional standards that keep healthcare providers up to date. If you're like me, you probably assume that there are safeguards in place to ensure that our doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers are staying current on research, advances, and information, but those standards that are in place are being threatened. We have with us today David Swankin, President and CEO of the Citizen Advocacy Center. And this is an organization that serves the public interest by enhancing the effectiveness and the accountability of health professional oversight bodies. We also have Ed Susank, a past and current board member of several healthcare organization boards. We'll talk today about three topics, including what one group is doing to uphold the systems that have been established to assure the public, like myself, of the competence of our healthcare professionals. We'll also talk about why this is so extremely important for citizens and leaders, and how we can continue to help assure the public that their healthcare providers practice safely. Given this concern over the lowering standards, a grassroots group has formed called the Right to Safe Care Coalition. Both of you have decided to become active and participate in this coalition. Can you tell me what is the mission and the purpose of the coalition and uh, why was it created? Sure, Lisa. Let me start with the why. The coalition was created in response to legislation that's been passed in several states and is under consideration in others that would undermine the effectiveness of the board certification system. We think that the existing process of rigorous objective review is the best thing that assures members of the public that their providers, their health care providers, are competent and up to date. Many hospitals and health care organizations seem to agree with the importance of board certification. And as you mentioned, there is unfortunately this growing movement that would undermine the importance of certification. State legislators are being asked to abandon these rigorous systems uh, in effect to simply trust individual providers to stay, uh, stay current, knowledgeable on their own. Trust is a wonderful thing, but let's back it up with a system of verification. As to purpose, our purpose is to build an alliance of like-minded organizations that support the concept of safe health care. We want to educate the public and other stakeholders on the danger that this kind of legislation poses. You know, there's been a lot of discussion lately about the so-called right to health care. Uh, we believe the public has a right to safe health care, and the best way to make it safe is through a, the programs of lifelong learning that are administered by outside credentialing organizations, by hospitals, and other health care delivery systems. Very good, very good. David, would you agree why that's why you became active as well? Yeah, I think he covered it pretty well. Um, one other point, it's an educational coalition. Mm -hmm. And the reason it was set up as an educational coalition is there's a pretty wide understanding that the public knows very little about the oversight system that we have today. They don't know the difference between licensing and certification. They really don't know what hospitals do mm -hmm. with regard to who can practice there. It's more than doctors, it's all the health professionals. And so for them, I think our feeling is if they get to understand the purpose of these programs that are in place, that's more important than understanding the nuances of what certification is, what licensing is. That's a hard, that's a hard sell. But they will understand, um, we believe, they'll understand that safe care means, uh, and quality care means up-to-date providers. That's a relatively easier message to get across. So why is it important for uh, others to get involved in the Right to Safe Care Coalition, like uh, community leaders, um, consumer groups, public, um, other leaders and organizations? Why is it important for them to get involved in the coalition? David? Well, you know, Ed and I were both involved in a study that AARP in Virginia conducted maybe about eight or nine years ago. Mm -hmm. And we asked people over 50. They weren't just AARP members. We asked people over 50, a large number of them in the state, 
um, about this notion of caring competence. And the biggest finding was that most of them felt, isn't that what the license on the wall means? When we go into a doctor's office, we see a license, we see a certification, mm -hmm. we see some piece of paper. Doesn't that mean that somebody checked up to make sure that they're currently competent? And when we said some do, some don't, they were amazed. They thought that we can't believe it's not done now. And, um, and once we said that, it was pretty, the next question was, well, would you support that if it's not true today? Oh, it ought to be true today. They were outraged, outraged that it wasn't true. And they were surprised it wasn't true. So that was the starting point, that there's an assumption that once you get health services from a doctor, a nurse, a pharmacist, anybody, um, that they are current and that they're up to date. There's an assumption that the system is already assuring that. I agree with what David says. And you know, anytime we talk about the delivery of health care, the patient is absolutely the most important stakeholder in the process. It's often their lives that are at stake in the process. And as David said, patients, members of the public in general, are already believe that the system is in place. Well, the state health care licensing boards do a very fine job qualifying providers for the initial issuance of the license, but very little attention is paid to the renewal process other than perhaps some requirement for continuing education. How much will vary from state to state? And there are at least three states that don't require physicians to take any continuing education classes in order to get their license to practice renewed. Now, as you mentioned, the, the board certification process, by contrast, is focused on the ongoing maintenance of skills. It too was initially focused on the initial granting of certification, but more and more the systems now are looking for ways to extend this into the renewal process. And this has taken on a, a term called maintenance of competence. And we think the maintenance of competence system is the best way to assure the public that they can rely on this as a measure of quality. And you know, it still has a way to go it, the, this maintenance of competence is what it's called, it is in place for physicians, at least board certified physicians, and for nurse anesthetists, they have a program and a number of other uh, nursing groups have it, but it is not common yet across the board. We still rely very much on continuing education, as Ed said, after the initial, uh, after, after the, the, the initial issuance of the licensure and the certification. So we all have a lot to learn from medicine and from nurse anesthetists. Um, th th it is possible to go, go beyond that and measure current competence. So healthcare providers in some states and in some situations can have a license on the wall but not have uh, proven their continuing competency for years and years and years and still have that on the wall. That's true, and first of all, they're not all board certified in, in health professions. In medicine, um, there's a lot of board certified doctors, but there's not nearly as many board certified nurses or pharmacists or uh, in other professions. Um, it's less common. And uh, there's another player here in terms from the public's point of view, and that is when, a, when health services are delivered in a hospital, mm -hmm. the hospitals have programs for credentialing and privileging doctors and other health professionals. And those are fancy words. What that means is that they want to assure themselves that they're competent to practice. And sometimes those programs do look at just current competence. They look at more than, let's see your pieces of paper, mm -hmm. let's see your license, when did you get it? What if, what if you had your license for 30 years right. and you're a doctor? Um, probably 90% of the prescription medicines that are out there today didn't exist when you went to school. So how do you know about that? And how do we know you know about it? So the notion of measuring and requiring people to demonstrate that they're currently competent um, is really important. Because there are some uh, health care providers that <coughs> may or may not be rigorous enough to stay up to date on the latest drugs, the latest research, um, and so 
you're saying that the Right to Safe Care Coalition helps to, uh, wants to educate consumers and others that this is critically important to learn more about the legislation that's trying to be pushed through that would um, take away our safeguards that are currently in place. And that's important. That's a really important point, the legislation. Mm -hmm. There's efforts now to take away these protections or not let them be put in in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's called pushback. I'm a lawyer. Somebody said, how would you like to take the bar exam? Mm -hmm. And I say, I wouldn't. And um, there's a lot of pushback by licensed physicians and other health professionals. Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to keep showing that I'm competent? Well, you know, pilots have to show every year that they're competent to fly the particular plane that they're flying. And we all accept that. We don't even know that. But I'll tell you, if we didn't, if they didn't have to do that, and there were a series of plane accidents, and the newspapers began to report, well, this person wasn't competent or hadn't shown they were competent to fly that plane, we wouldn't accept it. So we don't even let truck drivers drive more than 10 hours at a time or whatever the rule is. So there's plenty of other professions where the public is protected by these kinds of rules. Nobody has to like it, but I think that it's part of being a professional that you demonstrate, you stay current, and you demonstrate that you are current. The rate of change that's taking place uh, in healthcare is just amazing. I mean, I, I've heard statistics about the huge percentage of the material that physicians learn in medical school and in their residencies will be obsolete within five years. You know, the, the, the number of new papers, new procedures, as, as David said, the, the uh, new prescription drugs and other types of, th of therapies that are emerging are, are almost mind-boggling. And so, you know, as a layperson, as a member of the public, I don't understand all of those nuances, but I am relying on these professional mm -hmm. organizations, these board certification organizations, these hospitals, these other health care plans to make sure that the people that they are giving credentials to are up to date. So how do programs that require demonstrations of current competence that are put in place by credentialing organizations or hospitals or state health uh, licensing boards, how do those assure the public that our health care providers practice safely? Well, I'm happy to say that we have some evidence that the maintenance of certification process is producing valuable results. There have been some published studies, for example, that t t tell us about improved control of uh, asthma in children, improvements in HPV vaccination rates, uh, improved care, uh, improved diabetic care, control of blood sugar levels, improved care for people with hypertension, and improvement in the mammography screening for Medicare patients. So there is a growing body of evidence out there the certification organizations themselves are trying very hard to increase the amount of uh, information, the amount of proof, if you will, the studies to demonstrate that uh, these systems are making a difference, are producing better outcomes, and they're also trying to make the, the certification process uh, as easy as possible for the physicians, trying to minimize the amount of burden to the extent possible, and trying to make sure that it's relevant to the way their members are currently practicing. Well, thank you both for your insightful discussion today on this incredibly important uh, topic. Um, I think the, the movement to decrease the standards is uh, critically important that we understand it, that we uh, the public understands it so we can and, uh, fight against it to make sure that the public stays as safe as possible. You know, Lisa, we see it as a bit of a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. that r right now, the legislation is really focused on physicians, mm -hmm. but other healthcare professionals, as David mentioned, who have certification programs, see it as a very short step before all of those programs are threatened by state legislation that says you can no longer require that these people have this certification in order to practice. So then you're hoping that your health care provider is up to date. Exactly. Okay. We're back to trust. Yes. And I say let's have trust with verification. Agree. Agree. Well, thank you again for joining us today.